Trevor, I, I'm really excited to talk about the your ability to use tools to predict things by studying patterns and what's going on in in the social space using AI. And this sounds like something you've done a lot of thinking on and working on. And this is what I'd like to be our topic today. Yeah, that sounds great. It really started as a lot of the undergraduate research that I did at North Carolina State University and took a lot of that information and knowledge and now working on a startup, TSV Analytics, that uses a lot of the technology we worked on there to do exactly that. So excited to be here. I want to go ahead and read your your bio so people know a little bit more. You just indicated a couple of things. And, uh, and you and I met actually at <clears throat> Riot, which is not a riot, but mm -hmm. Raleigh Internet of Things, right? A mild yeah. internet riot, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, you put on a fabulous presentation about some of the work you're doing. And then you and I met afterwards and talked about how you've really successfully launched this uh, this business. And uh, so we want to hear more about that throughout our session. But uh, Trevor's last name is Free. Trevor Free is co-founder and CEO of TSV Analytics a startup here in Raleigh with remote workers, right, based on social media analytics research conducted at NC State University. Since graduating, Trevor has worked primarily in marketing analytics with big brands like IBM. You know IBM, right? Of course, Martin? yeah. Because, uh, you know, because Martin worked for, <clears throat> for IBM for about seven years. Yeah, yeah. Um, he is now working on, Trevor is now working on all aspects of marketing analytics with TSV, Having started research as a freshman, Trevor has been acquainted with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language processing techniques for many years and applied them to various projects, including COVID-19 research, paint and chemicals, and brand marketing. And uh, we really want to hear more about TSV, the name TSV, kind of signals what you do. So maybe you can fill that in and then we will uh, ask some questions as we go here about your uh, experience in AI in general and uh, more specifically to the things you're doing. Yeah, no, that sounds perfect. And TSV definitely is the basis of a lot of the work that we do and the research that I worked on. So TSV actually stands for topic, sentiment, and virality analytics. And that's really the main process that we use to analyze any conversation on social media. So we're able to look at what are the topics within a larger conversation theme that people are talking about? What is the sentiment of each of those topics and the posts that are included there? And then finally, that virality forecast is what you kind of hinted at the beginning, where it was how can we forecast what is this conversation going to look like in the next few weeks compared to what have we seen it look like in the past few weeks? So really giving marketers an idea of what is this trend going to look like in the future so that they're not always using historical data to try to make decisions that involve making a decision in the future and planning ahead. I, I think that's very important because sentiment analysis has been a very important aspect of AI and in any system. I mean, you know, uh, Dell created a massive control room after hell, uh, Dell Hell to monitor sentiment and reputation monitoring across the globe. And I'm sure that's evolved much more since its early stages. Now the introduction of AI patch catching patterns quicker and understanding what they are. And then, like you said, how is it moving? How is it traveling? But using this as a tool, because humans are far more predictable than they want to admit uh, is extremely is exciting. Exciting. especially on the sentiment analysis i think you mentioned like the brand reputation which is a huge component and how it's been evolving especially with social media i think one of the most difficult or challenging things that we've seen with sentiment analysis is looking at on social media are do people really mean the things that they're typing is there sarcasm how do emojis come into a play? There are so many different variables, especially in these super short form, informal text documents that are being sent out every single second, millisecond, whatever it is, all of the time that we're seeing all of this information come in and being able to quickly decide, is this positive, negative, neutral? What is the tonality of that conversation? It really has evolved quite a bit in 
specifically with TSV, when we've looked at sentiment analysis, we've been trying to figure out what is the best way that we can look at short text documents and determine what that sim- sentiment analysis really looks like. And especially with that tonality, the undertone of what people are talking about, being able to get that context has been a lot of the work that we've done in the sentiment analysis category. How, how has it evolved and how is it using AI? Because again, this is important. Like, I love what you said, you know, we got sarcasm, we've got hashtags, we've got emojis, we've got, we've got bots that are trying to dilute and, and sway with, uh, with conversations that aren't accurate. So there has to be some work in identifying the patterns of bots, which of course, you know, X now formerly known as Twitter sounds like what Prince was <laughs> is, uh, you know, he's got to get better at that. And, but there's so much data out there. If you can accurately get the veracity, is that the right word? The truthfulness along with how it's spreading, this is very useful information. Yeah, and I think that's especially with TSV, a lot of the work that we've done is really combining what I had mentioned is that topic filtering with the sentiment analysis. That's where you can really understand what is going on in this conversation because taking it back to the research work that I did at NC State when we were working with paint and chemical companies like Sherwin-Williams, they would want us to track the conversation around chemicals like BPA. And when we would look at the conversation around BPA, we would see there would be clusters or topics around bushels per acre and farming, business process automation and AI and business professionals of America. These completely irrelevant conversations that were popping up when we were looking for BPA specifically. So by combining that topic filtering and you can just remove all of those irrelevant conversations and really hone in on bisphenol A as BPA, you're able to understand what is the actual sentiment that's going on here, removing all of that irrelevant topics and conversations that were going on there and really hone in on what you actually care about and understand the sentiment there. And especially with, like you mentioned, the bots looking at a spam score of some I, some sense where you're able to see like, in this particular topic, over 90% of the conversation is repeated posts where it isn't new content that's being put out there. Honing in on that original content and what people are actually saying is the main goal. Um, Trevor, I know you, you're doing a lot of work for banks, specifically community banks. So let's say I'm the marketing director at a community bank. And um, you, you say, hey, I've got this new AI tool. And it's yeah. you know measuring sentiment and all this. Um, what what would I expect? You know what could I expect to get by way of information from you and your product so that I could make decisions about the bank's affairs or the mar- bank's marketing? Yeah, and one of the best examples I've seen one of the banks we're talking to work on is being able to understand in the large scheme of banking. Why are people actually switching banks and leaving the bigger banks to find these smaller banks? So we'll look around the conversation of literally people saying, I'm switching banks. I hate my bank. My bank never responds to me. Those specific conversations. And we're, then we're able to break them up into those topics and say, well, everyone is leaving bank X because they never answer their customer support calls. I can never get in touch with them. And then that's where the community bank can really come in because that's their sweet spot, being in the actual community, being able to talk to customers, answer them at any time when they're there, they can swoop in and say, hey, we kind of have a lot of the same capabilities. We're not as big, but we're able to answer your calls and tailor everything for you. And I think that's just one of the great examples where they can really hone in on a larger conversation, but still relate it back to here's the marketing messaging we should get out there to get in front of all of these people who may be wanting to switch from a huge bank down to a smaller one. This just reminds me of years ago when I was at IBM and uh, they were launching a product and, and the director that was speaking to us, we're in national service division said, I went to my friend that's the editor of the Washington Post. And he goes, we're spending all this money on marketing. Why are not we selling more? And he's, the answer he got from the editor of Washington Post, this is pre-social media, is you've mastered the art of marketing through reality, not delivering a better product. 
and mm -hmm. uh, it was like 600 people. And fortunately, uh, I was the only one laughing in the room. Uh, uh, <laughs> was that your last day? Yeah, no, but it was it was probably the early writing that I didn't fit in uh, because that idea. But, you know, this whole idea, we can just mark it through reality. And, and the greatness of social is that that's harder to do. I mean, you know, we, we're getting better, but also human beings are getting better at all, their own internal authenticity detector. And I, when I teach reviews online, I'll show reviews online from like an auto place that, that paid people to write reviews. And I'll show them in a class and they'll go, well, they got a free cookie. That's contrived. I never trust them. And they're positive reviews. So I think we have yeah. to take into account the human being out of survival is getting a little better and must, especially with AI, in their own personal sentiment analysis, maybe not even knowing it, because they, they review, the look at the top reviews, the negative reviews, and they're trying to go, well, that looks yeah. like their game, looks like they got something. And I'm sure you're taking that into account. Uh, and, you know, yeah. my big thing with the banks is they're still mastering the art of marketing through reality. Can but if you I give show an up, example of what you mean by yeah, that? yeah, big billboards on the sign telling me when I go into the bank how great it is to work there, and they've cut the number of people I can talk to in half. That's pretty simple math, you know. So, so instead, in other words, their mar their messaging was not matched with the action. Yeah, you know, the, it, let me tell you how great it is to be my customer, and the signs almost taking up more space where a human was before <laughs> that would answer my question. This is not, I yeah. mean, you know, some of this is you get to use a tool to give them basic common sense if you left your office and walked around in the real world. So in the past, yeah. in the past, as a marketing director, I would only find that out through market research. That's historical data. Um, maybe after months of, you know, I, I commission a study. Right. And six months later, I, you know, in a big bill later, I get some information about what I did wrong. Yeah. And and then I can take corrective action. And I think what you're saying, saying here, Trevor, is that this is nimble, active, uh, current on and on and on. So I can find up through last night at midnight what the sentiment is that people are saying about my product or service. Is yeah. that kind of it? Or maybe even right up yeah. to this moment. I don't know how current you exactly. are. Exactly. Yeah. So trying to get it as real time as possible, right? So up until this hour, what have people been saying, being able to up that data? And I think it's going even beyond up to this point. It's being able to predict what is going to be next, right? And how can we kind of approach that situation and understanding that? And I think you're totally right when it comes to the authenticity and people being able to understand that. And I can just think back to all of the individuals, companies, whoever it might be that have been using chat GPT, maybe a little too freely and just copy and pasting whatever it gives back to you out onto your website, onto social media, whatever it is, and not really having that pre fruit. And I think a lot of people can really understand. And like, as soon as they see something like that, they're going to be able to say, Oh, this was clearly written by AI and doesn't have that human touch of like actually having a tone of voice and like, what should this sound like? And people are really able to understand that. And I also think that comes back to social media in general and in the name is being social, right? Like it should be engaging with the community, understanding what your audience wants. And really for TSV, our main goal is to understand for your specific audience, what do they care about so that you can turn that back into messaging that's going to resonate with that audience based on what they care about. Yeah, that's so valuable because I don't know if you ever read the book. I think it was Watson wrote Father and Son, but it was it's, it's really worth reading. But it talked about yeah. how the original uh, head of IBM would deliberately sneak into the warehouse unexpected and walk around. No one was allowed to know he was there. It's the only way he got the information that was accurate. And I think that's an extreme crisis. We know in China it's a crisis now because it looks like they've got a hierarchical system where the head of the government's not getting accurate data. And, you know, getting that truthful data, that's the way he did it. He'd surprise walk up. And then in my years of IBM, it was all managing the perception to the person above them 
independent of reality as long as it wouldn't be caught by the news, you know? It's like undercover boss at a bigger scale, right? Yeah, right, right. Absolutely. It is like it. And I think, you know, it's profitable to have a clue of what your customer is doing. Uh, you and I, have we've seen so many things of some of the advertising examples where we go, how could they have made a, a decision that stupid? And there might be yeah. something with sentiment of your customers. Uh, I'll give one example. Older one is J.C. Binney's. You know, I yeah. knew the the persona of the customer. My wife loved to go there. It's a little bit, it was then, used to be a little bit older women, more mature, you know, all walks of life. And, uh, and they didn't want to look like a hooker. You know, and they wanted their coupon and they wanted something special. And then they got Ellen DeGeneres out that was apparently hated by their base. I didn't, I don't dislike Helen, but I knew immediately in my gut the women that went and shopped there didn't like her. And it would be the black, white, Hispanic, everything. Then they turned it to their metrosexual thing. Well, now they couldn't find anything. Then they made fun of their coupons. I mean, maybe you'll be able to, with a sentiment, head off massive, insane suicidal actions of large companies that smaller ones can't afford by also saying, hey, this is your audience. If you go down this walk, you will polarize or hate or lose massive amounts. That's a really powerful use of AI. And I'd love for you to talk about that because I think it's almost as high risk of them sticking their foot in their mouth or as we called in corporate world, shooting yourself in the first foot, then shooting it in the second to prove the first one an accident. Yeah, <laughs> no, I totally agree. And it kind of just reminds me of an example when we were working with those paint companies again during COVID-19 and we saw that they were actually touting methanol as a cure to COVID-19 in some Middle East countries, which definitely is not a good idea and will literally kill you if you ingest methanol. So we were able to let these paint and chemical companies know, hey, there's this huge conversation going on around this propaganda, sending out a message around hey, you should drink this substance and it'll cure you of COVID. And it's this substance that they've been using in their products for decades and trying to figure out how to kind of manage it correctly. And after one event in a single country that just completely flips the script on that, they have to be able to respond as quickly as possible to that event and say, hey, shut this down as quickly as possible. It's a PR nightmare. And that really took us back to the original goal of all of the work and trend analysis that we were doing. It's how can we predict and prevent another BPA baby bottle crisis, mm -hmm. right? So being able to look at all of these trends and monitor 50 to 100 chemicals at any time and then let them know out of all of these without you having to go through and comb through all of this data, here's what we recommend you should be prioritizing and getting out your messaging around. So it is very much a automated AI way to understand this larger conversation and hone in on like, what should you really care about and focus on right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so valuable because understanding who your specific customer personas are, understanding what their core values are and addressing them then allows you to start making predictions of the next product to roll out as well. So it's and and again, I think we keep seeing examples of, you know, poor Budweiser's got a tough time where anyone with half a brain would go, that's not going to go well. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, and it's not a comment about pro or con of what occurred. It's just like, wow, you're going to alienate your base. I mean, is there another way we can uh, include something? Just an understanding of the audience is huge nowadays, right? And with social media, everyone has a voice. So you have to be able to take in all of that feedback and what everyone is saying, right? So talk a little bit about the process. Let's, if you don't mind, let's take the cover off and talk about the mechanism here because this is pretty amazing and how AI is contributing because sentiment analysis, reputation monitoring, I mean, this is not new stuff. Reputation monitoring has been around. Sentiment analysis with human beings has been critical and uh, and now, but how are we now really using AI in this system? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think, especially with ChatGPT taking over, I think that's where a lot of people go when they hear AI is very much generative AI rather than all of the other massive applications that AI can really have. And 
specifically for TSV, when I think about AI, I more so lean towards machine learning rather than AI and getting a little more specific there. And that's really the core components of TSV and kind of our differentiator, because like you had mentioned, sentiment analysis and understanding the tonality, positive or negative around certain documents of text has been around for a very long time and is kind of an industry standard at this point. But really diving in and using those machine learning, natural language processing techniques like topic clustering and virality forecasting, that's where we're really getting into the depths of AI and all of the different ways that we can start to actually implement it. So for example, when we're looking at the conversation around a certain brand, for example, we can see of all of the posts that go out around this specific brand, what are those different topics based on us looking at every single post that mentioned that brand, how can we match them to kind of see what are similar conversations that are going on when people mention word X or word Y? Is there a more positive conversation that's happening there? And we can identify that topic. And it's really being able to send in all of these huge documents of text that are broken up and be able to see how can we break them up into those different micro conversations based on their topic defining keywords so we can break them out into those conversations. And then one of the things we've done recently with TSV actually is when we create those topics, rather than just name them as the topic defining keywords, we actually use a GPT model to give them a more cohesive name using all of those topic defining keywords rather than just give our user the top three keywords that showed up for this topic. And it just allows us to make the entire system so much more cohesive and of this entire conversation that our customers want to track, how can we make it as easy for, as possible for them to understand what those micro conversations are? And then when we move into that virality forecasting, which is looking at a lot of machine learning, forecasting into the future, we're able to understand on every single day, how often are people posting about this content? How often are they engaging? What does that look like? And be able to identify that trend, use that information and then predict into the future, how is this trend going to progress after today? And especially combining those two elements just makes it so much more valuable because if you're including all of this noise with irrelevant conversations that you aren't filtering out, your prediction is just going to be completely wrong because you're using the wrong input data for the output that you're going after. So that's really where TSV is implementing AI and machine learning to make social media management and analytics so much more intuitive while applying all of these machine learning, natural language processing techniques. Obviously, quite a bit of training was involved in this because, I mean, the fact of it is, is we are not at general AI. And when we are, we should be nervous. You know, we are really at yeah. the application of machine learning and very big machine learning models. That's you. That's the, the tool is everyone's name dropping artificial intelligence. We're really not even close there. It's still, a, as we like to consider it, a, 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 a pair it with the uh, the uh, entire internet in its head and not much smarter than it. So you yes. obviously have built your own model or you built your own coding and machine learning, and then you're studying it to see how it's acting, looking against real world experience where you know if emoji sarcasm or not, and then training that. Yes. And that was a lot of the work at NC State working on undergraduate research that was figuring out like, I mean, the TSV name came way later, but the process of understanding how can we collect this data, break it into topics, make it as easy as possible. That was a lot of the work that we did there. And specifically being able to work on it during COVID-19, I actually graduated at the height of the pandemic in the middle of 2020. So when I was graduating, it was really COVID was taking off and it was a not great time, but it was a great time for research because there was this huge event that hasn't happened in nearly a century to be able to look at what are people saying when it comes to COVID on social media. So one of the things that we actually identified is that a lot of people would self-diagnose themselves on social media before their test information, when they would go and get tested, would be available. 
So we found that people self-diagnosing themselves with COVID on social media was a more leading indicator than the actual test and case data that the states were getting. So by incorporating social media into a predictive model, we were able to have a more accurate COVID-19 case number forecasting model in 37 out of the 50 states compared to massive universities like UCLA, these massive organizations that were doing this by incorporating a piece of data that was so much more real time than these lagging variables like case numbers, testing numbers, all of that. So social media really has all of this power, like we were talking about, where if it's real time, it's so much more value. Wow, that is really fascinating. That <laughs> Not only that, the Thank possibility you. that some of these people were right in their self-diagnosis. They re- looked up the symptoms and so forth. And and that yeah. uh, by studying that, not, not that we're condoning that's a good idea, but by uh, sensing that's it. And, you know, yeah. I, I think if the government did a little better job in being in touch with your data, there probably would have been more trust because I, I travel all over the state in the rural towns during COVID is that the government could have not done any better job in undermining trust. I just can't imagine how they could have done a better job in undermining core trust of what they were saying than what they were doing. These towns would have very little outbreaks. So now they're shutting down and destroying the whole town. And then, you know, Uncle Bob goes and gets his thing and he and then he has a heart attack and they go, well, well, you know, there are no side effects. Well, why are these uncles? You know, why is this happening? Well, if you had had something that was connected to reality and go, look, there are risks here. Here's what's going on. And we're providing it. You might not have destroyed what I think is almost 100 percent credibility from the government. So they should have hired you. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> uh, it's funny. You would be amazed at what people actually post on social media in a public space. Like one of the specific projects while we're working on the COVID-19 research is being able to understand the journey that people would have while experiencing COVID-19. And we've found multiple cases where people would go through their entire COVID-19 journey. So pre-diagnosis where they said, oh, my, my throat's kind of sore, I can't smell for some reason, and that was maybe before we even knew that smell wasn't a side effect or mm-hmm. losing your sense of smell wasn't a side effect, but they were posting that, and then a few days later, they would say, oh, I think I'm going to go get tested. Then they would post, oh, I tested positive. Then they would say, oh, I'm going to the hospital, and then they would say, I'm getting discharged from the hospital, And we would be able to see and kind of see the entire timeline of their COVID-19 journey solely based on them posting on Twitter saying, here's everything that I'm experiencing, right? And it's just crazy how that compares to, oh, well, we have this one data point where this person came in and they tested positive and that's all we know about them, right? Mm -hmm. Where rather we could see that entire journey using their social media public posts that they're putting out there for anyone to read, right? I think you need to start a news bureau. I'm ready to sign up because I'm so I, I have a whole conversation of we don't have any news. We just have propaganda. We don't have news is reporting what's actually going <laughs> right now. I have more faith in your studying the patterns on Twitter on what's actually happening in the world, weeding out the bots, you know, weeding out the sarcasm where people are inadvertently reporting their direct experience and then you're filtering it. That to me would be better quality news than we can ever get through the main propaganda channels that they don't, they don't even know. They don't even know what journalism means anymore. And so I'm yeah. serious. I think you should, you know, consider this as another uh, career. I mean, I'd <laughs> sign up for your news. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, think about yeah. it. I mean, I always said, honest, and you know this, that if Twitter really invested in AI patterns of what's going on, and they actually produce news just from that, I guarantee it'd be 90% more accurate than anything you can see on national news. That was my, I mean, that was five years ago, but you'd have to filter out the noise. You'd have to filter out the bias. You'd have to filter out the box. I want to hear your views on it because you really are looking at something I saw five years ago that, but I still think they haven't done it yet. Yeah, not 
I think it is true and kind of how TSV is operating is very much in the crowdsourcing of understanding a large conversation, right? It's not about getting the source of truth from a single person right. or whatever it might be, right? And it's being able to look at these are people that are engaging in a conversation for a brand or around a disease or a certain chemical, whatever it might be, but being able to understand these are the people that are actually in there posting about all of this and being able to understand what are those topics that they actually care about and what's resonating with them, being able to use that as the fuel for here's what people are talking about is really the main thing rather than just having a single source, right? Well, this is very similar to the idea that human beings are better at lying with their words than they are their actions. And and you say, well, Martin, but he's studying just their words. No, he's studying them emoting. So in many ways, if you can listen past the, the their own version of propaganda and listen for their unconscious emoting that's going on, and that's what I hear you're filtering for, you're getting more to the behavioral truth. And, and historically, in every case, humans are better at lying with their words than their actions. I mean, you talk to anyone, I've known people in the government and, and you know, in, uh, you know th that have titles and jobs and there aren't on LinkedIn and all those people. And they go, yeah. you master what their body's saying, not what they're, they're saying. And, and yeah. tell me, this looks like you're starting to uncover this using machine learning. This is extremely exciting. Yeah. And I think even beyond like the topics and how people are engaging in this conversation, it's looking at what are those patterns? So for example, when we look at the virality forecast, is this a trending up conversation or is this conversation trending down? What are the best days of the week that people are posting about this content? What are the times of day that people are posting? Being able to understand that specific audience, how they're interacting with the conversation is really the main thing that we're focusing on. On the topic of news, yep. you know, you <laughs> triggered a chord with me about that. And so I'm wondering like, okay, how, how do you distinguish opinion from fact? And I don't know if we know the answer to that, but okay. you know, that's kind of important okay. in, sta in, in, in measuring sentiment and all that. But what I wanted to say that s struck a real big chord with me, Trevor, about your business, what you're doing, how you're doing it is that in uh, economics and investments, we talk about leading indicators, right? And historically, in that field, there's a bunch of leading indicators. And it strikes me, your story about the COVID, uh, the COVID story about the traditional way to measure a leading indicator was people walking yeah. in the doctor's office getting tested. And you're saying you all figured out that that there may be some merit to measuring just the uh, just the reporting online of I did some testing on my own, and that proved yeah. to be a very effective leading indicator. So I'm just wondering, you know, it just it blows the mind, really, doesn't it? And then it makes you wonder what other kinds of things are leading <clears throat> indicators under this new system that a business could incorporate that maybe they're looking at the old world and need to be, you know, and, and have an opportunity to use a new leading indicator. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it is just understanding what are those lagging variables that are out there right now? Like you mentioned the test cases, if it's people actually going to the sites and getting tested, right, which is even less than the amount of people that were doing at home tests, right, and being able to report those numbers. So I think it is just understanding, like, where is there a gap in where we're seeing a lot of the information where a lot of the predictions that do come with lagging variables, too, is they're predicting the spike way after the spike has already happened, right? And right. it's too late at that point. Mm -hmm. And it's being able to hit it at the right time and understand, like, okay, if there's a thousand people compared to 10 yesterday that are posting on social media, but the cases are still around 10, well, it's probably because the data isn't in there yet. Where can we kind of find that additional information? And I think it is a lot of infusing all of that data together. So it isn't just reliant on social media, public posts, like we had said, how can we distinguish the fact from fiction, right? So it's looking at a lot of that, but I think it is figuring out like, 
where are a lot of decisions made right now with those lagging variables and how can we supplement that with social media information and posts using the TSV process to filter out to make sure that it's the most accurate and then use that to make sure that we're giving the most accurate forecast into the future, right? It's almost a bit of like the wizard, right? I want to hire the wizard to tell me, <laughs> you know, what's going to happen to my business mm -hmm. if I go a certain way or mm -hmm. stay on a certain track. And I'm asking you to look into the future based upon your your tools. And so, yeah. you know, that's there's a lot of power in that if you're accurate in your predictions. <laughs> yes, a lot of power and trying to get the accuracy as powerful and accurate as possible, right? And I think that, like I was mentioning before, with adding in the topic filtering, when we were working with the paint companies, we saw the accuracy of our predictions jump from around 25% to around 75% once we implemented that topic filtering, just because all of that noise was just skewing everything when people were talking about business process automation for some business event that was going on. And it's like, oh, well, why is BPA starting to spike right now? And then we see that BPA doesn't really spike. It's how can we make sure that we have the most valuable and accurate inputs to the outputs that we're trying to predict into the future? Well, along that line on predict predictions, so how um, ha have you had a situation where you were surprised, like you were pretty, you know, pretty convinced that something was going to go this direction, and in fact, uh, based on your testing uh, uh, tools, and then in fact it went a different direction. That's a great question. Hmm. I know you've had That's a, a lot of question. successes, and I'm not trying to take away. I'm just kind of curious if there's an outlier that happened that surprised. Yeah. That's a great question. I don't know if I have as much, probably easier to forget the ones we might have guessed the <laughs> wrong way, but I think that we have quite a few examples where we saw this upcoming trend that was really supposed to spike. And we almost thought like, that's really bizarre. Like, why is this starting to spike so much? And why is that upcoming trend about to happen? Like we were working with a very large company that I won't name during one of our beta tests with TSV. And when we were looking at their the platform that we customized for them within TSV, we saw a huge negative sentiment spike upcoming around this company. And we weren't really sure what was going on there. And we started to dig in a little bit. There were some posts going on where it was negative. And we actually predicted to the day when there were massive layoffs, a huge executive firing for this specific company, all based on just the murmurs of people talking about this company and basically saying like, I don't know how this is gonna go. What is the direction they're heading in? It was wow. negative posts around Oh that my company. gosh. It's like being able to predict that to the moment and obviously working with the company as kind of their social media analytics tool, it wasn't, great for them to see that, but extremely valuable data to show them like, here's kind of what we think is going to happen within the TSV platform based on analyzing this specific. So basically layoffs were occurring and they didn't tell you, but the data was pro pointing towards it. So I'm sure that exactly. was, uh, you know, like the emperor feeling like he may be naked in the, in the public <laughs> view right now. And I think that's fantastic. And talk about building credibility, though, as an example to use. Look, you know, yeah. because most of these companies think that's hidden. You know, I'm not. It's But the truth is they're, they're murmurs before the big earthquake. And they Without may not doubt. realize those murmurs are conversations of concern and, and they're admin people that are just more street smart than executives ever could be talking about something, you know. And this this is giving a critical mass to data. That's a fantastic point here. Well, is, yeah. this is blockbuster. So we've had the COVID prediction. We've had the layoff prediction. Do you have a third? Well, well are aliens going to land? Is UFOs going to, is anything, what's going on with UFOs? There's a lot of conversations. Yeah, there. yeah, exactly. We, yeah. It, uh, is it well, smoke and mirrors? Or are they trying to actually uh, finally admit something, you know? Well, we'll have to set up a custom TSV platform for that conversation. I do have yeah. another. <laughs> I do have another good example of how we caught this one trend before it actually went crazy, and yeah. we're actually releasing a case study on this soon. We are working with a brand to understand the conversation around AI, artificial intelligence in general, and 
this was, I want to say, towards the end of last year when I think ChatGBT had just released and people were really starting to take honor to it and really starting to pay attention to it. And we saw when we were monitoring that conversation, there was a specific conversation around AI art or art mm -hmm. official intelligence is what everyone was talking about and specifically on that art component. And we have it down to the exact day that we predicted that AI art was around, it was about to spike. I think it was December 3rd of last year. We saw that that was about to happen. And then if you look at the amount of searches going on around AI art, it immediately spiked right after that with all of the companies that were like, you can send in your profile picture and we'll AI -ify it to make it look like it's AI generated, be able to use Dolly to create AI images. All of these different tools were starting to pop up and we saw that huge spike and let this company know that this was starting to happen before it really went viral and they were able to say, hey, we're kind of jumping on this train beforehand using it in their content. So that was another one where we kind of just saw it right before it started to go viral and let that come. Well, this is exciting because a lot of the concern with AI is that we're going to get more fake data out there. It'll be harder to find out what's actually going on. And here you're using yeah. an example of AI to counter that to say, no, we're actually using AI to filter and study the patterns of humans that are just uttering out there in the, in the ecoverse and yeah. filter out what's really going on that they might not be fully aware of at the individual level, but they're tipping their hand when you look at a bigger pattern. So I, I have hope, again, yeah. I, I'm not going to reiterate, don't rule out having another company that's a news bureau. I mean, I, I, I think there's a very large community. You just want to know what the heck's going on. I, my, yeah. myself, I listened to five bureaus to find out, did the building actually burn down or is it standing or was it not a building at all? You know, and simple, yeah. basic facts that uh, it's yeah. very hard to get accurate data on of the what happened. Yeah. And I think the first point that you mentioned there, especially around AI content being put out there. Is it accurate? Is it biased? I think that is still a huge component of that we're even starting to try to figure out how to deal with because yep. it is very much this feedback loop conundrum that is about to happen, especially as AI continues to learn on a lot of the content that's put out there on the internet. Is it just taking in information that GPT or whatever model that created that content actually put out based on its training data? So it's just learning off of its own data once again. And if that data is biased, is it just going to keep continuing that loop where it's using more and more biased data and not actually taking in the facts where AI wasn't generating that five years ago, a year ago, whatever it might be, right? So I think that is still a huge component in figuring out how to figure out was this actually AI generated, right? Yeah. And it's becoming a bigger problem because, I mean, you know, educational systems are might, might actually have to get students to think and talk in front of a human being to see if they know their material versus just regurgitating material and creating reports, which I don't think is a good use of an educational system. I think teaching yeah. you, someone like you how to really think and solve problems, and that's a good use of an educational system and studying patterns from the past we can learn from. So, you know, the good yeah. news is the gigs up on education. They're going to actually have to evolve or become more and more obsolete. Yeah. It's interesting talking with some of the uh, professors at NC State and elsewhere that I've just met during research and other things and hearing how they're integrating AI into their actual classes, right? Like one of the professors that I talked to is all for it and is very much into the analytics, AI, data science. And he's very much like, I'm building this into my marketing course because these students are going to use this tool for the rest of their lifetime that they're in marketing now, right? And it's mm -hmm. how to actually use that tool effectively and not rely on it as a crutch. And I think that's even where for TSB, when we give these AI content ideas, it's not, this is exactly what you should post. It's really that inspiration to not hit writer's block and go from zero to one to make that happen so much quicker rather than relying on your own inspiration idea to hit that writer's block and just get over that on your own. So it'll be very interesting to see how it evolves over the next five, 10 or less years and all of that. Well, you know, that 
maybe raises a really, you know, another kind of topic around this. And that is what's on a lot of people's mind is, you know, they hear about how this is going to affect their job. And I think it's pretty clear with the AI that's come out, particularly, um, you know, generative AI so far, it's like augmenting your job. It's not replacing your job, but predictions are totally. that jobs will be replaced. Predictions are that that you know we we're going to see uh, we're going to see a lot of potential changes in the workforce. Uh, you know, in the coming years, you just mentioned that the professors, including um, ChatGPT, into into the marketing uh, of yeah of a course. So, what is your sense about the impact on jobs? and occupations of AI from your vantage point as a startup CEO with a lot of experience in AI. Yeah. And I think it is the case right now where it is very much augmentation rather than replacing specific jobs, right? I think there are a hundred percent jobs that are going to be replaced, right? Like mm -hmm. I think just thinking back to when I was a kid so long ago, Right. It was when you arrive on toll roads, there were people there that actually took your change and like were able to actually do that in person. It's like, why do we have someone there all the time when we can have an AI tool to really be able to take in that information and do it on its own? And I think it's a lot of the jobs that are going to be replaced with AI are going to require other jobs to be created to monitor and maintain that AI and make sure that it's working correctly and efficiently, right? So maybe it's not having someone actually going in and collecting the tolls every day, but then maybe they have someone that's monitoring all of those systems and making sure that everything is working correctly with the AI component, right? So I'm not as worried about it replacing too many jobs. And if it does replace that many jobs, I think there's gonna be so many more that are added on top of that with the new requirements with these AI tools that will probably be more technical jobs that require that type of input. But I think that's kind of the value in being able to understand how these systems work and being able to teach younger students, here's how these tools are actually working. And so you know that when you go out into the future, this is how it's actually putting all of this together. And here's how you should be using it effectively, morally, ethically, whatever that might be in the future. Well, you know, part, one of the courses that we're, we're updating and, and, uh, and, and, and going to be delivering uh, again pretty soon, we speak about the fourth industrial revolution and, and it really is about this. And, uh, you know, the, the encouraging part about what you said is that in the past, whenever massive innovations have taken course, there there's always negative predi pred predictions like it's you know it's going to replace everybody when them have a job and and yeah. yet in all the prior industrial revolutions that we've seen, it's actually ended up creating more jobs, more wealth, more GDP, uh, better finances for everybody and. So, exactly. uh, you know, who knows? Maybe your analytic tool will have a prediction on jobs. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, who, who knows where it's going to end up? But I don't, I don't know that it's going to be as doomy and gloomy as everyone thinks or the pessimists would like mm -hmm. to think. And I, but I think it is clearly, clearly uh, already impacting every single occupation, mm -hmm. every single job, every mm -hmm. business, government too, in terms of how we get yep. the job done. And, and obviously, it's going to mean fewer people for a certain, uh, for a certain business. Uh, get, yeah. You know, fewer people will get the same production out, et cetera. We're seeing that. So I think that we're going to see more efficiencies, faster, better. But, you know, your, your business is a case in point where um, if it wasn't for AI, you wouldn't have a business with a bunch of colleagues. Yeah. You know, growing business. So it's that's brand new. So. Exactly. You're, you're a replacement worker. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, no, you've created a whole new industry here of new information. Yeah. Badly needed. So here the AI is threatening to create so much noise, I'll have no idea what the truth is. And here you're using AI to sift through the noise and find out what's really going on. I think that's fantastic and yeah. really exciting. I, I am going to stay connected to you to see if we can collaborate in having news again. Yeah, I brought that up yeah. enough, but and I'm not letting that one go. You know, I think it serves everybody yeah. to know what's going on. Yeah. 
Well, this has really been exciting. And please tell people how they can learn more about you. We'll put the links and we'll put the links of our training as well below. But just let people know how they can connect to you, learn more about it. And I'm excited to hear about your continued growth in the field. I think there's a great conversation of another slant on the AI industry. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on and can definitely connect with me either through LinkedIn, Trevor Faree, or email trevor at tsvanalytics.com. And if you want to check out the actually new TSV Analytics site that we just launched today, it's tsvanalytics.com. So definitely check it out. Well, that sounds great, Tre Trevor. It was so wonderful to meet you a few weeks yeah. ago, and I'm glad that you participated today. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, some good things will come out of this for you. And, and uh, we're excited. We're, we're going to track your progress and, and uh, stay in touch. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Thanks Terrific. so much for having me on. Have a great day. <laughs>